Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for the Hendricks Center for Cultural Engagement. And our topic today is, and this may sound strange, reviving evangelism. I mean, evangelism is about new life. So when you're reviving new life, you've got an issue on, on your hands. And my guests today are here in studio is Nathan. Is it Wagnon? Is that how you pronounce your that last name? That sounds good to me, brother. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, never, I'm never quite <laughs> sure when I see spellings I'm not familiar with. Yeah, He's director good. of equipping and apologetics at Watermark Church here in Dallas. Yeah, that's right. And, and you are located in Dallas. You know, so you've got some churches that are in the suburbs, but you are right there we are smack near right the high five. Right in Dallas proper. That's exactly right. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And then, and then Kevin Palau, who is president of the Lewis Palau Association, and he is coming to us via Skype from Beaverton, Oregon, a beautiful part of the country. <laughs> and uh, and so, um, so Kevin, thanks for being a part of this. You were a part of this survey, and I think the way I want to do this is start with you and ask, one, how did you get involved in the survey, and two... What was your reaction when you saw the results of what this survey is saying? This is a Barna survey on reviving evangelism. I'll just hold it up so people can see it. A Barna report, and it was produced in partnership with Alpha USA. It says, current realities that demand a new vision for sharing faith. So I'm sure we're going to be dealing with the second half of this a lot. Yes, so go yes. for it. Tell us, how did you get in this gig? Well, you know, it's uh, you know, if people know anything about the Luis Palau Association, they would hopefully think evangelism, because growing up as a kid, Dad was always known as the Billy Graham of Latin America. So evangelism has been in my blood and DNA my whole life. But but um, you know, being based in Portland, Oregon, which is a you know, if you guys are the buckle of the Bible Belt, I'm not sure what that makes us. We're kind of the anti. You're on the edge of the cross. <laughs> You're on the edge of the upside down cross. So that gap. That when I talk about America, I say, think of America as an upside down cross. It runs through the Bible Belt from east to west and up the middle of the country, and then there are those two corners yes. of the country, which you could almost get a passport and go to a different place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, and you know, so it's funny. People often will will wonder, like, why is the Luis Palau Association? Isn't your dad Latin American? Why did you end up in Portland, Oregon? Mom's a native Oregonian, and mom and dad met 60 years ago at Multnomah School of the Bible. Ah. So for no better reason than that, Portland's been home. But now I we really view it as a God thing that we've been based here for decades because it really has forced us to take a hard look at what is working, what's actually effective in evangelism, not in places where it's easy, but in places in the West, in this case, the Northwest, that are very, very challenging. So so the question of this survey, um, I joined the board of Alpha USA not that many months ago, and um, um, the Barna folks um, have been friends, uh, David Kinneman for years, and so when it came to them saying, you know, we want to commission a fresh study and interview all kinds of people, particularly younger people, younger people that would call themselves Christ followers, as to how they view evangelism, um, I said, yes, I would absolutely love to be part of it. And I think they put me part of it partly because of our context in Portland, Oregon, because we're in a challenging place, and partly because as the Luis Palau Association, we think about evangelism a lot, and we think about how do you mobilize people for evangelism, not just put up there an evangelist to preach, but it's all about how do you mobilize the masses of Jesus followers to be more bold and confident in sharing their faith. So I think for those reasons, they somehow thought, maybe this guy has something to say. Hmm. And, and what's interesting about that is because you also have a global perspective, I mean, you do um, – you do campaigns around the world. You're aware of what it is to do uh, evangelistic programs in places where the culture is very open and receptive, and places where it also is very much a challenge. That's yeah, it's very very true. There's places in the global south where it's absolutely harvest time, and it feels like no matter what you do, you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And then there's places where it is pushing a rock uphill. It is it's a challenge. But I am very very encouraged by um, by what I'm seeing and and the ways that God is working 
in his people in in evangelism. I'm I'm actually more encouraged than people might think. Okay, well we'll come back to that because we're going to need a word of encouragement in light of some of the <laughs> numbers that we have here. Um, yeah. Nathan, talk about what you do at Watermark. Yeah, so I'm the director of equipping and apologetics, as you said, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of what I do is uh, try to equip our body to do the work of the ministry. So, I mean, where Ephesians 4:12 is central to the way we think about ministry, and so a lot of it is just like, uh, hey, how can I get how can I get the average Joe guy sitting in the pew uh, deployed in the way that Jesus wants him to be deployed for the kingdom? So we very much. One of our guiding principles as an equipping ministry is we don't do ministry to people. We do it through them. And so uh, my job is to uh, equip, train, deploy, assist, come alongside of uh, the church as it's doing what Jesus wants it to do. And one of the things I get to do in that regard is um, our lead our apologetics ministry, which there's not a whole lot of formal apologetics ministries in local churches around the country or world. And so uh, it's just a unique opportunity to engage consistently with skeptics, atheists, agnostics, people who are having a crisis of faith, and uh, engage with them around the uh, central claims of Christianity. So that's the world I live in. Okay, so Kevin was born into this. I mean, you know, he, he, there was no escape for him. <laughs> uh, but what about you? What's, what's the background of your story? What led you into ministry? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I was I was born into a strong Christian home. I grew up a, a, in the Southern Baptist tradition. I uh, went to Washita Baptist University in Arkansas, and then came down here with uh, a couple of hundred dollars in my uh, wallet and everything I owned in my car. Didn't know I was going to make my first Dallas Seminary school payment, um, but Jesus just provided. And so, uh, I've, it, when, when I was at Washita. I uh, got exposed to just uh, – uh, I went on an Israel trip. I got exposed to just more of the historical Jesus as opposed to the felt board Jesus <laughs> of the Southern Baptist tradition, and, uh, and that whetted my appetite, and I've always just wanted to know more and more um, about this man and the life he lived and the claims he made, and so – when you were a student here, were you attending Watermark? And, or, or? Yeah, Watermark was brand new. Okay. It, when I moved down here, we were the, my first Sunday was with a couple hundred people in a junior high, you know. And so all through my seminary time here at DTS, uh, I was a, just a lay leader in the church and helped them, uh, you know, do their thing. It was a lot of ready, fire, aim kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, was a part of the young adult ministry because I was a young adult. Not anymore, but I used to be. And uh, helped him start the porch, which is now, I mean, it's a that's a beast in its own. Yeah. You know, uh, here in Dallas, but our young adult ministry, which we have coming up, uh, Kevin, you'd uh, be interested in this. We have coming up in a couple of weeks. We're doing uh, a conference for young adults called Awaken here in Dallas, and are going to be talking about now. Is that, that an generation. annual thing that you do, or is that a special conference? It's uh, well, we don't know if it's going to be annual or not. This is the inaugural oh, one, so we'll see. Okay. Yeah, because um, we'll probably air after the conference has taken place, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah, why yeah, I raised right. it. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a dive into reviving evangelism, and I open it up, and I don't go very far in. I'm on page 21, and um, the first chapter that I see has the title "Evangelism Erosion." Okay, which um, makes me nervous. Uh, in fact, the quote on the side says. If evangelism is eroding, we must examine its wider context, understand, and respond. And then there are some of these statistics that are in here uh, about um, – and, and they've got categories of kinds of people that they're surveying, lapsed Christians, religious non-Christians, atheists and agnostics, etc. And, uh, uh, and, and what's really interesting as you move through this study is the um, claim – and I think this is the one that uh, – that got all the attention, that a significant amount of millennials – and I'm not quite sure how to characterize this – not comfortable with, uh, not willing to do, uh, not open to, don't Well, I think they want. said – I think they said uh, – one of the things I read in there was they said almost half of the respondents said that they thought it was wrong to try to proselytize or evangelize or convince someone else that – Christianity was true. Kevin, is that? And this is yeah. And this is above. I mean, that would be not. A, that wouldn't be a surprise at all if you were talking about 
unchurched, you know, the average unchurched younger person, a millennial. But this is supposed to be identified uh, interviewing um, evangelical or active Jesus following yeah. millennials. That yeah. ha- almost half of them are saying, I think it's morally wrong to try to convert someone. Okay, so, now, and which, which is interesting because. <laughs> Um, if you think about the traditional definition of what an evangelical is, okay, <laughs> all right, and I'm thinking of Babington's quadrilateral, you know, where uh, there are four characteristics. One of those characteristics is you share Jesus. Yeah. Yes, that's so, right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using non-technical language, but that's the thrust <laughs> of it. I mean, you, know, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that the Bible is the Word of God, you're committed to... Uh, to the uniqueness of the gospel, and you share Jesus. I mean, that's yes. kind of the definition. So we've got people in the category who aren't in the category, or seemingly not in a part of the category. So Kevin, you were close to this survey. Um, interpret that for us. What do you think we're hearing and being told? Well, you know, it's funny. I wasn't nearly as alarmed or surprised, maybe I should say, as some people that read it, because in our experience of several decades of doing larger scale evangelism, these festivals that we do, that we pioneered, we we used to do Billy Graham style crusades for for 50 years. But about 20 years ago, because of the context being so different in Portland, we switched over to a more of a music festival approach, a little more contemporary, et cetera. But we've always known that in the U.S., um, the the majority of those that are genuinely love the Lord, they attend evangelical churches, the majority of them really are skittish about evangelism. They hope someone else will do it. They hope the pastor will do it. They really don't want to do it themselves. They love and hope the quote attributed to St. Francis is true, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. And they're desperately hoping that it's never necessary to use words. And they feel that if they just are nice to people and love people and serve, that that's the gospel and I'm okay. And, and you know, we find that in a typical, even a solid evangelical church, in many cases, it's not much more than 10, 15% of the people that, that actively engage in evangelism. So I'm never surprised, and I find that many people are practical universalists. They wouldn't really want to be pinned down, but they practically speaking feel God is good and loving, everyone's okay in the end. I definitely believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. I think it would be great if my friends knew Jesus, but if they don't, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So I think there are these undercurrents um, among, not everybody, but among many evangelical young people that kind of undercut evangelism. And it's just, with all the cultural pressures, young people, even if they live in the Bible Belt, they're affected very much by social media, and and it's just not um, comfortable to express clearly the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Even if you say it in a humble way, you know, well, yes, I do believe that every single person needs to have an encounter with Jesus Christ, or they face a Christless eternity. Well, what about other religions? And so many people find it very difficult. And um, I think it's a stark spotlight to say that almost 50 percent question whether it's morally right to do it. I think we have a lot of work to do to kind of evangelize for evangelism within the evangelical church and and bring forth the biblical nature of it, the beauty of it, the joy of it. I think positive is always better. How do we positively remind Jesus followers of the goodness of the good news. I always say to people, if you really believe the good news is good news, if you dwell on that, if the Holy Spirit's revived your own heart and faith and love for people, you'll find it easier. But the average person, it's easier to stick with people that already believe the gospel and almost never open your mouth and try to share with someone who doesn't. Yeah, I think the thing I think the thing that surprises me about this is it's one thing to say I'm afraid to share Jesus, or I'm nervous to share Jesus, or I'm not comfortable sharing Jesus. I mean, think about the myriads of ways you could say that one way or yeah. another. And to say, I'm not sure it's moral to share Jesus. Now, that that strikes me as being, if I can say it, a level up in decibels. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so th- – and, and what really is interesting about that is, is that 
if that's where people are landing, I think it shows. I'll say it this way. I'm, I, I, I'm in the back of my ears echoing, you say it positively. And I'm going, How can I do this? <laughs> um, Put a spin on it. Yeah. And, and basically it is, what it shows is, I'll say it negatively and positively, or negatively and it's positively, but it's not positive. Negatively it shows how ineffective we have been in teaching people the importance of evangelism. Said positively with reference to the culture is, and how effective the culture has been in neutering what it is that the church says about evangelism. Yes. And, uh, you know, we, we, like to, we like to say, and in some cases pretend, that we're not that impacted by the culture. But this seems to me to be an indicator we may be far more impacted than the cult to the culture than we're willing to recognize. Now, you minister to yep. this mm-hmm. age group that we're talking about, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll share with you another phenomenon that I find myself often doing, which is I find myself when I'm in audiences, particularly with people of my age, okay, and I am speaking – I am not a millennial, never well, have been. You're a spring been. chicken, man. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a boomer who just went to the Social Security office, okay? So, uh, <laughs> all right, so I'm on that end of the equation. <laughs> And uh, and yet I find myself having to defend millennials a lot of times when I'm speaking to people of my age group. You know, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, they really are sweethearted uh, people, et cetera. Their, their desires oftentimes are in the right place. But on this one, <clears throat> I'm struggling. How do you do that? Yeah. So, so yeah. help me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I tell people pretty consistently that uh, even when I engage with skeptics and atheists and agnostics, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So a lot of people – like uh, you guys have probably heard this story before, but in the 50s, there was a guy at Harvard named George Buttrick. He was the chaplain of Harvard. And as you know, I mean, even though the Jesus movement was kind of going on during that time, people would consistently come by his office and, I don't believe in God. And his standard response to these people was, well, come on in. Let's sit down and tell me about the God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in him either. Hmm. Just talking about, like, the way that you're thinking about God is not biblical Mm -hmm. at all. And, and, uh, And so a lot of what I do as an apologist is clarify for people what Christianity is. And I think it translates immediately over to the issue that we're talking about, because I think that there, it, myself being one of them, grew up in a context where evangelism was seen at, in very reductionistic terms of a, like a transaction. So you're, you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. You definitely need – you need somebody to – Take your all of your badness, or God. God's angry at you, and He's going to judge you and throw you into hell, and be and be glad about it, you know. And so you better trust Jesus, or else, kind of thing. And and so I think for a long time that's what evangelism, at least in this, you know, cultures that I've been a part of, have seen evangelism as people view it as well. I've, okay, you're trying to make me into a used car salesman that's going to go try to close a deal. And and so I think that that's probably ha- uh, plays into this in, on some level where people are like, I don't want to do that. And and again, I'm going, hey, well, why don't you tell me what your view of evangelism is? I probably don't want to do that either. Yeah. But that's not yeah. what biblical yep. evangelism is. Yep. And so it's a recasting. It's a re. It's casting in a positive light. Um, the what evangelism is and should be. Um, and and then another point is. Uh, I think that uh, I'm encouraged, like Kevin said, I'm encouraged because I think we have a unique opportunity to uh, recapture some of the essential nature of what the gospel is. Because, again, for so long, I think it's been given in terms that are very reductionistic. And so when when you're able to recast a vision for what the gospel is, then you're able to start not with with sin, but with creation, and you know God saying, "Hey, I, I created you for a purpose, and in my image, I, I care about you. I love you. I have a purpose for you." 
Um, and then talk about sin, not in terms of, you know, like I've heard you say, you dirty rotten scoundrel. Yeah, um, I call it Jimmy Cagney y- y- theology. Yeah. <laughs> you dirty rat, you shouldn't <laughs> you be doing rat. that. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's yeah. the way a lot of people yeah. think. That That's what people yeah. think Christianity is. Right. And so it's like, no, like sin is a distortion. It's a brokenness that needs healing. And look, I, I, in my experience, I don't. I never have to convince people that they're broken. Mm-hmm. That there, There's an intuitiveness that people know that. And so just re, reframing it, recasting it in these ways, I think, will be – we have a unique opportunity to, to do yeah. that right now. Okay. Yes. So you've talked about well, – I, I don't want to spend so much time analyzing this as kind of talking about, okay, so how do we deal with this? Hmm. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to transition. It's early, but I'm going to transition there. And let's talk a little bit about the reductionistic gospel and what the gospel ought to be. Hmm. And I can't think of a better person to ask – uh, than you, Kevin, because uh, you do this on a regular basis. Talk about what the reductionistic gospel is so that people can identify yeah. what it is, and then yeah. talk about what that recasting might look like. How do we – How do we? Um, I'm going to coin a word. How, how do we de-reductionize <laughs> <laughs> the gospel, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good – no, it's a, it's a really good question. In a place like Portland, I, every place has what, what, what you just referenced, this – sense of uh um i think you know I, I my understanding of christianity is such that i would never be interested in a place like portland where many people come from other parts of the country to get away from what they perceive mm-hmm. of as a you know a hellfire and brimstone conservative right-wing republican and i'm going to get to come to the promise there are land no fires of, in like, oregon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's so people come in some cases kind of knowing what they don't like about Christianity. And so we do spend, as, as followers of Jesus in Portland, we, we spend a lot of time trying to help, when a lot of listening and a lot of, of, of trying to help people understand the beauty and the joy of understanding what a relationship with God through Christ can look like. So, yeah, I, I agree that taking a, a view of the gospel that isn't so much a transactional say this prayer and you'll be okay. Because the question for a lot of people in Portland isn't so much, how do I get right with God? I understand that God exists. I understand that I'm a sinner and I need to understand how to make my relationship with God right. Many people in Portland aren't remotely asking that question. They've said, I'm not sure that there is a God. I'm here to enjoy nature and I'm enjoying life. And you fundamentalist Christians, you know, what, what have you got that I don't have? So we, we began our journey in Portland um, recognizing this 10-foot hole of misunderstanding that we were in in trying to communicate the gospel to people in Portland. You know, we're not talking the same language. So we said we had to back up and say we have to start with relationship building and earning the right to even be in conversation. So we went to our mayor. We went to the openly gay mayor of Portland, Oregon. At the time, he was the first openly gay mayor of a top 25 city and said, hey, you know what? As a Christian community, particularly the evangelical community, we're, we know that we're known mostly for what we're against and not what we're for. And we're a little embarrassed that we have not been in conversation with the city. If we could mobilize thousands of Jesus followers to love and serve Portland and make Portland a better place, how could we do that in relationship with you? So we have spent years earning trust and building relationships and kind of changing the narrative to say, Jesus followers are seeking the shalom of Portland. We're seeking the peace and prosperity of Portland. There's a common good. We all want to see kids in foster care well taken care of and refugees well taken care of and our public schools thriving. So we had to start um, with a rebuilding of trust and saying all of us, Jesus followers, non-Jesus followers, we care about the city. We would say because we're made in the image and likeness of God, we have something in us that wants to see beauty and flourishing and joy in life, and we all share that. So as Jesus followers, we want to work to make Portland a better place. So we spent years learning to live well with people that disagreed with us, loving and serving, but I would say this very, very strongly, We also recognize that unintentionally we kind of drifted a bit. It's very easy to mobilize people in a place like Portland to love and serve their neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so what we recognized was we had to form a a little team to really keep evangelism focused because while I do agree that we had to earn the right to be heard and rebuild trust, 
it cannot stop there. And we needed to take advantage of, when I say take advantage, I mean in the proper sense, leverage the credibility and the good relationships that were being built for the sake of the good news. So to me, you know, when you look at, at the bigger picture of the joy of following Christ, it does begin with creation. It begins with a sense of God created this entire universe. Think of what that means. Think of what it means to be in right relationship with this creation, with each other, with creation itself, which in Portland people are very environmentally conscious. You know, when, we, when you can put salvation and a right relationship with God in a broader context of creation care and relational harmony as a society, and then get to the fact of Jesus Christ as a perfect representation of what it looks like to be a human being that is flourishing. I mean, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than the 30 second, you know, four spiritual laws kind of a, a, a conversation. We find people in Portland far more open to those kind of conversations than you'd think. Mm -hmm. And I've been going through my uh, an alpha group. Many people may be familiar with alpha as an evangelistic tool. My wife and I are going through our first alpha group, and it has been remarkable to see these nine guests, my Jewish atheist neighbor, some people that are in recovery from heroin addiction, an openly gay couple, Richard and RJ, that have been coming to church the last six weeks, the openness to talk about Jesus. Three of those people, including Richard, who's uh, openly gay and in a relationship with RJ, has come to faith in Christ. I mean, it's crazy the people that are coming to faith in Christ as they see the beauty of the good news, we're not hiding anything, we're not hiding the fact of sin and repentance and who Jesus is, but I think when they can see it and you can uh, kind of topple some of the straw men and some of the negative views and it's all just about legalism, I've been shocked at how open people in Portland are. That's interesting. That's <clears throat> you know, you're talking about a context and a culture that many people would describe as post-Christian. and. Yes. Uh, one of the challenges for the church, this is true across the entire country, although I think it, it, it's you know, coming in the South and more slowly, um, it is, this is the reality that the church is going to be functioning in, in the United States mm -hmm. uh, yes. with this next generation. And so thinking through how evangelism changes as a result and, and really thinking through the message, you know, one of the things that struck me as you went through this is when I think of the what I think we're calling the reductionistic gospel, it's very individualized. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very, uh, I would say, privatized, if I can say it that way. It's about me and my God and getting right with me and my God, mm -hmm. and that's about all you think about. But the moment you connect the gospel to the creation, who we're designed to be, how we're designed to relate to one another, how we're designed to relate to God, you know, you're in the space of what I like to call the great commandment, love God yes. with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that's relational. That's, that's the, 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 one of the places the gospel is supposed to take us is to a place where we are able to live that out. Mm. And, and, and to live that out in surprising ways. I mean, loving your neighbor means loving your enemy. You know, it gets translated yes. that way by Jesus. So, so when you when you when you put it in those kinds of terms, and you put it in that relational as opposed to a more abstract, personalized, privatized sphere, all of a sudden the dynamics for evangelism and the angles that open up to talk about seem to me to broaden significantly. I think Absolutely. it's interesting that just from the New Testament, you're talking about individualized and privatized. One of the things that I think it, it struck me one time, I can't remember how long it's been, but it struck me that I just began to realize that all, that the vast majority of the you commandments in the New Testament are plural. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, yeah, it's he, a good old. Is, I say Jesus was a southerner. He may have lived in Galilee, but he was a southerner. <laughs> all y'all, all y'all, get out there. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I, I think that that makes us. Uh, it, it forces us to engage the Great Commission from a like communal standpoint. It's not just a I've got like a, what am I doing to share my faith? I think it, there's the community of faith aspect. And that's one of the things that we at at Watermark take really seriously is how are we as a local body championing this uh, you know this value in our in our body. And so we 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 tell a lot of stories. We uh, when people are 
uh, when people are sharing their faith in the workplace or on in, in their neighborhoods or at schools or whatever they're doing, and we're seeing the Holy Spirit bring fruit out of this, then we we elevate those stories and cast that vision of, hey, this is what the Spirit is doing with us. And I've, I've found that that has been deeply encouraging for people who otherwise might feel this maybe weight or burden of all of Christendom on their shoulders when they're thinking like, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? And it's almost like this. It, it's almost a neurosis that sometimes people have. And yet I think that communal um, environment invites people in to a group as opposed to, hey, you need to go down to the street corner and, you know, proclaim the end of the world is coming if that makes sense mm-hmm. so um I, so that's one version of the reduction reductionistic gospel that you're talking about it, is, yeah it yeah. totally is it's it's very yeah it's very individualized it's very privatized um it's it's not you, you you know when you hear about evangelism i think most people think about okay what are you personally doing mm-hmm. and i think that um if you recast that as hey what are we doing mm-hmm. um that's and good. it doesn't have to look like just one method or one, you know, you, we, that's another part of the reductionistic, you know, uh, the way this plays out is we, we corner ourselves into certain methodologies, into certain and, – and then when the methodology doesn't work in a certain context, then all of a sudden we're tongue-tied and uh, I don't know what to do with this. And so that's why we – I mean, at least us at Watermark, we're trying to teach our people that the relational aspect of it – the uh, the fact that you're earning the right to have a conversation with with someone whom God uh, who's made in the image of God who God deeply loves and who God is trying to save and 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 you're doing that together that's a that's a way different thing oh sure it is and and I, I like to say usually when I talk about this subject I'll, I'll use this example I think this goes back to evangelism explosion when I was a Christian you know if you died today. You know, and it's a form of the question. If you died today, would you know what would happen? Yeah, the Kennedy question. That's yeah. exactly right. And I sit there and I go, "What does that actually communicate about what the goal of the gospel mm-hmm. is?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and I'm going, I don't think that's quite the goal. You know, yeah. the goal of the gospel is you can live life in in, and I'm going to use a Portland phrase. In <laughs> harmony with God, okay. In harmony, you know, in conjunction with the way you were created, in a, in a, in a way that is um, this is I wouldn't use this in evangelism, but in a way that's congruent with the mm-hmm. way God made you. Yes. And and when you start there, it isn't just about what your fate is. The way I like to say it, the way you can identify the reductionistic gospel is by: Are you being told you're being saved from something? Mm. Or are you being told you're being saved into a relationship with someone? Yeah, right. Yes, and with the goal of I love I love there's a there's a wonderful church in down in San Francisco, which is an equally like Portland, you know, challenging place. You have to articulate the good news well, you know, mm-hmm. to, to be heard. They they say, you know, joining God in the renewal of all things. Mm-hmm. It's a simple way to say, you know, is our goal, it's it's collectively, we as a church body, but I would say the church all in Portland, we're together joining God in what ultimately is going to be the renewal of all things. Including us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Including us. Yeah. Absolutely including yeah. us. It's not, it's not, it's not. It's so not it just, from it's above. Not than us. It's not that it isn't, of course it's about personal one-on-one and my life with Jesus Christ, but it, you're right, the reductionist part, it's not that that's not true, it's that it's not enough. Right. Yeah. Right. It reduces it. So it's, I think that is a way to true. say it. It's not that it's wrong. I mean, a person needs to personally understand right. these things about themselves. But but I think the way we, we can communicate it with such joy in community and recognize that God has given certain people in every congregation uh, the gift of evangelism. There's a small percentage of people that will never call themselves an evangelist. They'll never be paid to do it. But I think that biblically, Ephesians 4 talks about these gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You know, you find certain people that have that unique gifting and calling and experience And I think one of the values in a church is to help identify those people that are maybe naturally open and gifted in that way and unleash them and empower them. I think that's a key thing. And then what you said as well about celebrating, let people see the Mm -hmm. fact that people are coming to faith in Christ all the time, even in Portland, Oregon. 
I think too, I think, the, uh, most of my academic work has been in the area of discipleship and obviously evangelism is kind of a subcategory of that. But what, one of the key things that I've seen in discipleship conversations is a lot of people will think, hey, um, like they feel like that they're responsible for uh, their own growth. They feel like they're responsible for you know, like if I if I don't go do this, then you know, uh, then the world is not saved. Sometimes you hear a lot of language around. It really could be aptly described as a savior complex. You know, like if I don't do this, who's going to do it? Kind of thing. And one of the things that I've seen is as, as I've had conversations with people is a reorientation around that concept to say, hey, no, actually, God is the one who is. Uh, transforming you. He's the one who started this work in you. He's the one who's going to complete it. And oh, by the way, he's also the one who's saving people. Mm -hmm. And so instead of them thinking, having this weight of responsibility, it's like, no, go co-labor with him. Go. He's inviting you to, he's inviting you to join him in what he's doing. But just know if you're going to follow Jesus, then you're going to be involved in this because that's what he's doing. He's saving the world. Yeah. It reminds me of the passage in first Corinthians, you know, uh, one person plants, another yeah. waters, but it's God who causes, causes the, the growth. growth. That's right. Yes. And so um, uh, it, it's it's that picture. Well, I I I think the beauty of a of a what do we call it a a, a de reductionized gospel. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like I'm on Sesame Invert Street. That, yeah. right? <laughs> and then the word for today is anyway. Um, you know, one of the advantages is is that all of a sudden the gospel becomes. A much bigger thing to be a part of. Oh, huge! Than than the way we do it mm -hmm. when we privatize and transactionalize it alone. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that there isn't that moment of transaction. Uh -huh. It's it's right. not that that's what's going on. Right. But the next question to ask is why did God do this? Yep. I mean, why does God seek to save us? Well, it isn't just so we check a box and say, I'm okay, I'm going to heaven one day. It's, it's to shape us into the people mm -hmm. he created us to be to begin with and to make us into a not just a better person, but to make and when you grab grab people together and put them in a community to make them a better community and to make them in a better way to serve those around them. I mean, it's all, you know, when I ask, what is what is forgiveness of sins for, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's Ephesians 2.10. You know, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then I love to point this out, Ephesians 2.11 to 22, which is the next passage. Mm -hmm is the example of the good work. Yeah. And the example of the good work is the reconciliation, reconciliation work that God is doing between groups of people. Yeah, it tears walls down. Okay? Yeah. And you look at our world and where are our struggles? Our struggles are between groups of people. Mm -hmm. So the gospel steps right into the mess mm -hmm. that is our world and says, there's a way to fix this. Mm -hmm. yes. And the way to fix it is not just to think about it individually. The way to fix it is to think about it, what God is doing among and is capable of doing among peoples, mm -hmm. and then what that means for the people who participate in that, and then how they witness to that. The other side of this that I think is so important, and you've already suggested it, Kevin, by what you've said, is when you crash a stereotype about what people think Christianity is, you know, what they left when they came to Oregon, that kind of thing, all of a sudden this open space is created into which um, I have a conversation with you because I know you care about me and I care about you, and we can discuss things more openly, and boom, you're off and running. So evangelism doesn't have to be this programmed, programmatic thing. It emerges naturally in the relationships that we have. Is that part of the recasting that we're talking about? I think it is, and I, and I think that, um, you know, I, and I think we all wish it was just as easy that if we just help people understand it this way, they would all still go do it. <laughs> my, my experience is that even in churches, so yes, I agree, and at the same time, I think there's still that need for a never-ending, cajoling, encouraging, inspiring, equipping everyday believers to realize that they have a role to play it's not just for the professionals, but that it does involve them being willing to go out of their comfort zones. So like it's never going to be a hundred percent easy and natural to talk about Jesus. It's always awkward. <laughs> it's always awkward, and, there, yeah. and there's. Always, but I think once you break that fear, once you can break through, um, 
I think it can be lessened. I mean, I remember having a conversation when we began 10 years ago, this effort of the serving the community side, trying to seek the shalom of Portland together. I remember having a conversation with our school superintendent, Carol, at the time she was Portland public school superintendent and like our mayor at the time was a really prominent member of Portland's LGBTQ community. So she had a lot of misgivings about these evangelicals and especially the idea of evangelical churches partnering with public schools to just love and serve the schools. And her first concern when I when we sat down, of course, was proselytizing. You know, all the evangelicals are going to proselytize. And I kind of laughed and said, if that's your concern, you don't know our people very well at all because we couldn't pay most of them to ever open their mouth and talk about... 50% of them <laughs> think it's immoral. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. It led to a very interesting conversation because she's like, oh, yeah, I guess I did think that the problem was going to be holding back. She didn't put it this way, but like the image of holding back the rabid, fire-breathing, mm. every evangelical cannot wait to hand out tracts and share their faith. We know that the reality is we're desperately trying to get a bigger percentage of our wonderful people in our evangelical churches to even begin to pray for people in their life that don't know Christ. Mm -hmm. To say, Lord, could you give me the courage to just have a spiritual conversation, to offer to pray to someone rather than just saying, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Wow, I I am sorry to hear that. You know, I actually believe that God hears our prayers, and I'm not saying I'm a miracle worker or a healer, but, you know, we just pray about that. I mean, it's sometimes simple things that we can do, but um, I would say that one of the real go- roles for those in pastoral leadership, people that have the gift of evangelism in particular, um, is to encourage and inspire everyday believers to believe that it is One, it's a responsibility, you know, whether we feel like it or not, we are called to bear witness to Jesus Christ and to be unashamed of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't mean that we're all immediately going for the jugular and immediately jumping into the deep end of substitutionary atonement, but but to even have a spiritual conversation, look and lean into, ask people questions about their spiritual background. I mean, I find that if we are unapologetic, unashamed, joyful, if they know that we believe what we say we believe and we're excited about it, um, a lot of barriers go down. Most of the time, unbelievers can tell that we are scared to death and hope that it never comes up. And that just makes them awkward about the whole conversation as well. Hmm. So, so uh, Nathan, you minister to young people and you know, kind of charged with encouraging them in this regard. Um, I know you've got a sp- special kind of group there at Watermark. So uh, <laughs> not sure what you mean by that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure they're. I'm not they're sure I would qualify them as the typical <laughs> millennial. But anyway, um, uh, so what do you do to encourage them in this regard? Man, I think uh, you know, I, as Kevin, as you were talking, I was praying and and just asking the Lord, like, hey, what um, what what would you have me communicate? And I think that this is probably the primary thing that that we try to do. And that is, instead of trying to get somebody to accept a series of propositions or doctrinal statements, um, somebody said one time, I don't know who it was, but you know, I'll attribute it to the whole church, I guess, <laughs> that, uh, that the greatest apologetic is not uh, a rational defense or you know, a, a trying to convince somebody. And you're saying this something. is an apologist, so uh, I'm ready yeah, for the other half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the greatest apologetic is love. Mm-hmm. And um, arguments don't win people to Christ. Love does, and and uh, and so I think when you, in fact, I just I just came from a lunch where a guy sat down. He's a new friend of mine, and uh, he literally asked. He was like, "Hey, I've, I hear a lot of people talk about Jesus, but he was like, but some, there's something about you that's different, and I don't know what it is." And I was able to just tell him, like, "Man, my job is not to, uh, my job is primarily not to, you know." teach you the Bible so that you can become a better theologian. My, my job is not primarily to, um, you know, make sure that you do all these things so that you check a list and you can say you're a good Christian. My primary job is to accurately portray and image the beauty of Christ to mm-hmm. you. And if I'm by the Holy Spirit, if I'm able to do that, I, I don't have to worry about you responding. Like, mm-hmm. you're, you're, when people see God as he actually is, then they respond. 
And, and that's why I like, I don't have to worry about being rejected. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about, you know, people, um, calling me names or whatever. In fact, that doesn't happen very often because when you engage people personally and when you show them the love of God, um, that's, uh, embodied in Jesus and now in us through the spirit, then, um, man, you're you, then as we as we would say in the South. Now you're cooking with grease, you know. <laughs> now, now things are happening, yeah. and and that's the way I think about it. And and I would say in my experience, um, I think I think that's the way probably all of us should think about it. You know, it. I'm reminded of the book of Hebrews where it says that the calling of the people of God is to gather together in such a way that they stimulate one another to mm-hmm. love and good deeds. Yep. Yes. And yep. and then Jesus said it. He said, you know, in the midst of the passage on loving your enemy, that you love them in such a way that they see your good works and praise the Father mm-hmm. in heaven. Yep. So if you're asking, and, and if you think about the Spirit of God, I can, once I get started, I won't stop. <laughs> you know, well, if you think about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is primarily relational. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. yep. they are characteristics that we apply in the relationships that we have with one another. And you can't think about being properly related with God, to God without thinking about how you're relating to other people. Those mm-hmm. two things go together. They're in the Great Commandment. Mm-hmm. They're in the Ten Commandments. I mean, like I say, once you start, you don't stop. It's literally woven through the whole of Scripture. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what we've been saying, our time's are rapidly going away here, the, the key to reviving evangelism is not introducing a program it's a it's being a certain kind of person Mm -hmm. yes i i I could not agree more the reason i'm so encouraged after living 50 plus years in portland oregon kind of a challenging place is that we're seeing uh such a different view of what it means to follow christ we've gone from from the evangelical community being a a pariah or or at best kind of unknown where to now where where it's almost demanded by our city, county, and state leaders that the evangelical community must be around the table on any key social issue discussion yeah, because yeah. that's who actually shows up and without complaining, agitating, asking for money is actually serving 70% of the public schools, revolutionizing the foster care system, radically impacting um, health care, refugee care, without abandoning a joyful expression of the good news. We're seeing more people come to Christ, more churches planted, as we have in a holistic way loved and served people in relationship. We, we have a great relationship with our gay and lesbian community in Portland. Mm. We had agreed to disagree on all kinds of core things. We're not, we're not downplaying mm-hmm. important issues. Mm-hmm. We've been able to say, you know what, we're going to disagree on some stuff that's probably never going to change, but we can focus together on making Portland a better place. And that has only accentuated and opened doors for evangelism. And we are really, really encouraged to be seeing more and more people come to Christ as we've done both evangelism and social justice slash serving the community well. So that so, reviving evangelism is it has really involved, in some cases, recasting evangelism, putting evangelism back in its proper place, which is that when you share the good news of what it means to relate to God, you're also sharing the good news of how people can better relate to one another. Hmm. And you step into the Great Commission and the Great Commandment simultaneously, and in the midst of doing that, you revisit the creation mandate, which is we were image created to image God well together, male and female. Hmm. And when you put that all together, okay, you're you're in the center of what God is asking us to be as people. It's that way He created us, and when He saves us, that's what He creates us to be. And yes. so, uh, and, and then we're supposed to model that and share that, and when we do that. We witness hmm. to who God is, and in the process, open the door for evangelism. And I think that would be the way I would summarize what it is we've tried to say today. What do you think? <laughs> I'm sold. Okay. <laughs> All right. And as we say when you're at the auction, sold to the guy, <laughs> the bald guy. In, in, in Beaverton, Skype. Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much, Kevin, for being a part of the table. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. It's been a pleasure to have you. 
Thank you so much. And thank you, Nathan, for being a part of the table and sharing with us a little bit about your ministry and how how um, you seek to encourage millennials in this regard. Mm-hmm. And we thank you for being a part of the table and hope you'll join us again soon. If you have a topic that you'd like for us to consider for a future episode, please email us at the table at dts.edu. We take these under consideration, and you know, maybe one day your topic will show up at the table podcast. And, and we wish you all well and hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.